Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey, it's Alan Cross, and this summer we thought we would do something special with the Ongoing History Podcast and give you, our fantastic audience, a bonus episode every Sunday from now through Labor Day. We're going all the way back to the spring of 2010 and a 15-part deep dive into the history of Alternative Rock. It's the History of Alt Rock series. So every Sunday, you'll get a brand new episode of this series that examines every single facet of Alt Rock from the 1950s right up to, well, pretty much today. And don't worry, because we'll have a brand new episode of the Ongoing History Podcast for you every Wednesday as well. So you're getting two podcasts every week now through Labor Day. I hope you enjoy. And thanks for supporting the ongoing history of new music. If the doomsayers are correct, something monumental, something transformative is going to happen on December 21st, 2012. This is the day the Vaktun cycle ends. The Mayan long count calendar finally runs out. After 5,125 years, it comes to an end date. What will happen next is up for debate. Now, it could be the end of the world. Earth may collide with Nibiru, its long-hidden nemesis planet. Some say a black hole may swallow us up, a catastrophic shift in polar magnetic fields. Others believe we will achieve some kind of spiritual enlightenment, which will usher humankind into a new era of peace. Or maybe nothing will happen. Okay, so maybe we'll get another bad John Cusack movie on the subject, which is not good, and the prospect is admittedly frightening, but it, you know, it's just a movie. The reason I'm not too panicky is because history has shown that humans are really, really bad at predicting the apocalypse with any degree of certainty. I have my own theory. I believe that there may be a fundamental shift on planet Earth around the time of December 21st, 2012, but my shift has to do with rock music. No, wait, wait no, stay with me on this. I'm not crazy, or, or at least I, I, I might not be. I hope not. This is the 15th and final chapter of a series I call The Complete History of Alt Rock. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome again. I'm Alan Cross, and here we are at the end, for now, of our broad sweeping history of the development and evolution of what punk, new wave, grunge, Britpop, indie, and everything else that has at one time been lumped into the category of alternative rock hath wrought. We started all the way back in the 1950s, and we tracked the early pioneers through the 60s and early 70s, followed by the explosion of the 1970s and early 80s, the alt-rock nation days of the 1990s, and the rise of indie rock in the first decade of the 21st century. On the last show, Chapter 14, we explored a theory held by me and others, like the late Tony Wilson of Factory Records. That theory contends that rock and pop music are locked in a death struggle that plays itself out like clockwork every 13 years. Rock rises in creativity and popularity until it peaks, and then it slowly goes into decline before bottoming out. Meanwhile, 180 degrees out of phase of this, pop drops in popularity in lockstep with rock's ascendance and then hits bottom just as rock peaks. And then pop experiences a bounce and starts rising in popularity at the same time and same speed, rock falls apart. Now, by my calculations and those of a few others, the rock versus pop cycle has played itself out through four complete cycles since 1951. If you want to know why, you have to go back and review chapter 14. Here in 2010, we are deep within the fifth cycle, which we established began in the spring of 2003. Rock peaked in 2005 and hit bottom sometime in the last couple of years. Meanwhile, pop has been at the forefront of music. Taylor Swift, Susan Boyle, Lady Gaga, and there have been many, many people who have declared that rock is, in fact, dead, just like we heard in 1999, 1988, 1972, and 1960. If our theory of the rock versus pop cycle holds steady, then a renaissance in rock isn't due to start until the spring of 2016, which is 13 years after 2003. But I'm going to make a prediction. I think the length of this cycle is going to shrink. And the thing that's making it happen is technology. And to understand that, we must begin with this. And he fills it only half 
Suzanne Vega, a singer-songwriter from California with an a cappella track from her 1987 album, Solitude Standing. That was the song German engineers used to perfect an algorithm that could shrink a song from a CD down to a computer file one-tenth its original size. This new invention was called ISO MPEG-1 Audio Layer 3, which is MP3 to you and me. And that was 1991 by the time it was perfected. Now, MP3 technology made it possible for anyone to zip music through this new thing called the Internet. It was awkward at first because uploading and downloading took forever, and the software you had to use was clunky and awful. But by the summer of 1999, things had improved a lot. Computer modems were better, networks were faster, the cost of hard drives had begun to drop, and browsers were better and easier to use. At the same time, there was growing dissatisfaction by music fans about the price and selection of music, especially amongst college students. Now, first, the rock fans amongst them were very discouraged by how pop music had taken over. It was Backstreet and Britney all the time. Second, much of the rock that was being made was unappealing. The awesomeness of the alt nation of the early 1990s, you know, with grunge and industrial and Manchester and Britpop, had faded away. And disillusion had set in, especially with the specter of Kurt Cobain's suicide still very much in the air. New metal ruled. And as we saw in Chapter 13, that scene was very, very polarizing. Third, rock, especially alt-rock, was flailing, looking for the next big thing. Labels were just throwing stuff against the wall just to see if anything would stick, and the result was a series of one-hit wonders. Fourth, despite years of promising that the price of CDs would eventually come down, they hadn't. And to make matters worse, the CD single was being phased out in North America. That meant that even if you did like a song put out by one of those one-hit wonders, you had to pony up 18 bucks or more just to get that one track. People still wanted music, but they wanted more than they could afford. And sometimes they just couldn't get what they wanted. But everything changed on June 1st, 1999, a date that is every bit as important to the history of rock, of all music actually, than anything else you can imagine. This was the date an amateur computer programmer named Sean Fanning gave something he developed to 30 friends on the promise that they not share it with anyone else. He called his invention Napster. And, uh, well, things really haven't been the same since. As Linkin Park was on their way to selling more than 4.8 million copies of their Hybrid Theory album in 2001, more than 26 million people were using Napster. And the issue was bigger than that. There were dozens of other peer-to-peer file-sharing sites. There was Scour and QtMX and Freenet and iMesh, BearShare, eDonkey, Audio Galaxy, Rapster, Grokster, LimeWire, Kazaa, endless list of these things. This may not have been such a big deal if a number of companies hadn't figured out a way to liberate MP3 files from the desktop computer. A court ruling came down in June of 1999, almost exactly the same time Sean Fanning set Napster free. And this court ruling asserted that portable MP3 players were in fact legal. And when some of the big boys in the consumer electronics field, including Apple and their little invention called the iPod in October of 2001, when they entered this space, MP3s were in and CDs on their way out. The result was that after decades of almost uninterrupted growth, sales of recorded music began to drop. Between 2000 and the start of 2009, CD sales were cut in half in just about every territory around the world. The drop was most dramatic in the U.S., down 52% through a decade. An industry that almost sold a billion discs a year sold 374 million in 2009. That's not a decline, that's a collapse. The biggest selling album of 2000 was InSync's No Strings Attached with 10 million copies. The biggest selling album of 2002 was The Eminem Show with 8 million. In 2003, it was 50 Cent with 7 million. 2004, Usher with uh, about the same, and then it really starts to get bad. 2005, Mariah Carey, 4.9 million. 2006, High School Musical, 3.7 million. 2007, Josh Groban with 3.6 million. 2008, Lil Wayne with 2.88 million. 2009, with Taylor Swift with 3.2 million. Now, let's look at the biggest selling rock records. 
2005, the last year rock music peaked as far as our theory of rock versus pop cycles are concerned. That was Green Day's American Idiot, sold 3.4 million copies. 2006, the biggest selling rock record was Nickelback with 2.7 million. 2007, Linkin Park and 2.1 million. 2008, Coldplay and Viva La Vida with 2.1 million. And 2009, Kings of Leon with the biggest selling rock CD in all of America and they sold just 1.4 million copies of Only By The Night. And yes, digital downloads were going up, but those gains could not cover the losses from the drop in CD sales. For the recorded music industry, life really sucked. The Red Hot Chili Peppers with Danny California, a single from their double disc Stadium Arcadium, which came out on May 5th, 2006, and eventually sold about 6.5 million copies by the end of the decade. It was one of the few bright spots in an otherwise dismal time for the recording industry. But that's all business. What about the music itself? Well, we will discuss that in a moment. All right, let's move away from the gloom of the recorded music industry situation and talk for a while about the music that came out during this age of downloading. By the end of 2006, it was very clear that rock had once again peaked and was starting a slow decline. Yet, as in the past, momentum would keep moving things forward for another year or so. If you stepped back and really listened to what was going on in 2006 and 2007, you would have noticed that things had opened up a bit. Yes, guitar-heavy sounds that drew from the grunge and punk of the 1990s still dominated, but it seemed that there was a little more variety, at least for a little while. Emblematic of this were bands like the White Stripes as they continued down their bluesy road. Modest Mouse sounded like a reincarnation of the Talking Heads. The Bravery and the Killers brought the sound of 80s-style keyboards back. And then there was Coldplay. By 2008, they seemed to be living up to their promise as a group who could be the biggest band of the last decade. And when their 2008 album, Viva La Vida, came out, it all started to come true. Now, compared to the standards of the old pre-Napster days, Coldplay's record sales weren't that great. But they did sell millions upon millions of concert tickets. Same can be said for the Foo Fighters. Sales of their music were respectable, but the big paydays came from playing live. By the summer of 2008, the Foo's were able to play in front of 86,000 fans at Wembley Stadium in London. While the big boys like the Foo Fighters and Coldplay and Weezer and Pearl Jam and U2 continued to do their thing through the latter half of the Zero Zeros, a couple of trends and movements emerged in the alt-rock universe. The first was emo. Now, emo had its roots in the American underground hardcore punk scene of the 1980s, but by the late 1990s, it had begun to bubble up towards the mainstream. Some bands had taken the angst of emo and applied pop sensibilities to the melodies and arrangements. It was still really emotional and filled with tales of heartbreak and loss, but a lot easier to digest and to like a lot quicker, which, of course, made them marketable. And after the events of 9-11, music with anguish seemed to be necessary. Now, Jimmy Eat World was a big part of this. Their Bleed American album, an emo-style record, sold a million copies through 2002 and 2003. And then after that, the race was on to sign emo and emo-ish bands. And boy, we got a lot. Dashboard Confessional, Taking Back Sunday, Panic at the Disco, Fallout Boy, Story of the Year, Funeral for a Friend, 30 Seconds to Mars. An emo subculture was created to service all this with its own fashion and hairstyles and language. And for a while, it seemed that every new band was emo. Even bands that weren't emo, like Green Day and Weezer, believe it or not, were wrongly lumped into this scene. Perhaps the biggest band of them all was this group. My Chemical Romance. Emo was one of those alt-rock trends that burned very hot and very bright, and it didn't last very long. By 2009, most rock fans had tired of it and moved on. 
but moved on to what? Well, here's where we must return to a discussion of technology. What happened next could have never happened 10 years earlier. Hold on. No matter what the economic or technological climate, people are going to make music and want to listen to music. The second half of the first decade of the 21st century may have really sucked from a business point of view, but that obscured something very positive. At no point in history were more people making music, distributing music, and consuming music. Freed from having to go through the traditional gatekeepers, record labels, radio stations, video channels, fans were faced with a nearly infinite supply of music online. And what's more, fans now called the shots in how they consume this music. Let's go through some of these universe-shaking developments. One, many people really don't feel the need to go to a record store anymore iTunes, P2P programs, and torrent sites give us almost instant access to whatever we want, often whenever the spirit moves us and wherever we happen to be. And if you really must have a physical copy of something, ordering it online is easy. It's more convenient and you never have to worry about something never being in stock after you've taken all the time to go down to the store to check it out. Two, with the introduction of online retailers like iTunes, we no longer have to buy an entire album if we just want one song with few exceptions, of course. We now have the freedom to buy music a la carte, if we choose to pay anything for it at all. Three, digital rights management, those locks that made it very, very difficult to share music, even when it came to moving legitimately purchased songs from one device to another that you all own, that's all dead. DRM is done. All those years the industry spent trying to lock down music and suing people who shared music, forget about it. And four, social media is changing the way we find out about music, consume it, and share it with others. Hear about a new band, you want to experience their music at no risk? Well, just do a Google search, read a review on a blog, or look up their MySpace page and whatever you can find on YouTube. You like them? Well, that's great. Then link that page to your friends through Facebook or Twitter. Meanwhile, maybe the band is offering a free download. Take a couple of seconds to grab it and then spread it to your friends. This has greatly leveled the playing field. This has also led to an even greater rise in indie culture. With the number of major record labels down to just four, music has returned to the early, early days of recorded music, when small, nimble, independent record companies can quickly capitalize on a song, or a band, or an album, or a scene, or a trend. No longer did you have to be on a major label to get global distribution of your music. And there was no waiting either. I mean, you post a song or a video and suddenly anyone anywhere on the planet with internet access could hear it and see it and feel it. That kind of access was the stuff of science fiction in 1995. And today we just take it for granted. Indie culture is now, in fact, a powerful force just about everywhere in the world. In fact, being labeled indie can be extremely important for your brand and your appeal and your cred as a musician. If you get support from the right hipster bloggers, well, then you can get real famous real fast. Just ask bands like, oh, Vampire Weekend. In addition to the rise of indie culture, the latter half of the aughts also saw some new experiments in marketing. We began to hear of something called the 360 deal. Now, this is a new type of business relationship between an artist or some kind of music industry entity. It could be a record label or it could be a promoter or it could be some different kind of company. Whatever the case, that company agrees to provide money up front and financial support for an artist in exchange for the artist giving up a percentage of all the other revenue streams that traditionally they would have kept to themselves. For example, the label will advance money for touring, promotion, and marketing because they believe that the artist is an investment that could pay off big time. As a trade-off for this financial security, the artist spiffs the company's shares in things like concert ticket sales, sales of t-shirts, licensing arrangements, and so on. Now, theoretically, this benefits both sides. And since there's not a lot of money to be made from selling records anymore, then perhaps both parties can survive and thrive by supporting each other. Although big artists have entered 360 deals, the vast majority of bands entering these agreements are just starting out. And it's not just deals with major labels. Indie labels use this model a lot, too. 
And then we have the grand experiments by bands such as Nine Inch Nails and Radiohead. They realize that they're big enough that they don't really need a record deal. Instead, they manage their massive fan bases directly, often selling products directly to fans because, uh, well, they, they no longer need a label as a middleman. In October of 2007, Radiohead launched their In Rainbows album with its famous tip jar approach. Here's the record, download it, pay whatever you want for it. If you choose to pay nothing, well, you know what, that's your choice. Very risky, but the plan worked beautifully. Radiohead estimates that the net they received for In Rainbows was bigger than for the seven albums they recorded for EMI. And when the album was released in a physical form through a series of independent labels, it sold another million copies or so. Giving away music as part of a sound business strategy? Well, if you had suggested this in 1995, you would have been committed. Radiohead with Body Snatchers from the In Rainbows album, an experiment that got everyone thinking about how to get music into the hands of fans for free, or close to free, while still being able to be paid themselves. So we're at about the end of our big, broad survey of the history of alt-rock. Where do things stand 60 years after the birth of rock and roll? And will that rock versus pop cycle of life continue? Let's draw some broad conclusions, at least the best we can. For the past 15 shows, we've tried to trace the birth and evolution of what we called alt-rock. Here are 10 possible conclusions. Number one, the concept of alt-rock no longer exists. It's just different flavors of rock with some being more popular than others. Everything has a shot at being mainstream, if only for a little while. Number two, all the silos have broken down. When Johnny Rotten walked into Malcolm McLaren's clothing shop in 1975, he was immediately considered for the job of lead singer of the Sex Pistols based on the fact that he was wearing an I Hate Pink Floyd t-shirt. And for decades, rock was very tribal. You were either into the alternative scene or you were a mainstream rocker. It was very us versus them. Now today, you can be into whatever music you want and no one will bat an eye, at least not in the same way as it was in, say, 1989. There is no stigma about liking both the Beatles and some death metal band from Norway. Arcade Fire, every bit as viable as a musical choice as ACDC. Three, technology is driving the creation of music, the distribution of music, and the consumption of music as never before. And people now expect to get whatever song they want, whenever they want it, wherever they happen to be, on whatever device they happen to have at that moment. This is affecting behaviors on all sides. The artist, the fan, the promoter, the record company, the record store. Four, we have no idea where these behaviors might lead. Who would have guessed that the Sony Walkman would turn us all into headphone-wearing zombies inside our individual bubbles of music? Think about what the skip button on CD players did for our attention spans and tolerances when it came to music. Napster and its descendants not only allowed us to get music for free, but it also had a sociological component. Anyone who remembers those early days of file sharing will no doubt recall a time when you found a stranger somewhere on the planet who had musical tastes that were just like yours. You weren't alone in your musical needs. Someone else understood. Now today we take that for granted, but back then that was very, very powerful. Five, attitudes about the need to possess music are changing. If I can access any song I want, any time I feel like it, who says I actually have to have that music on my person? Why can't I just get it from the cloud, that mysterious part of the internet that has the ability to store anything? What, for example, happens when there's simple and seamless internet access to music in your car? Six, a portion of us will still want to own music in a physical form. Both bands and record labels will continue to issue special editions and feature stuff that you can't download. For example, you can't download a t-shirt or a poster that you can put on your wall. At least not yet. Number seven. After a period of time when we had an infinite amount of music to choose from, we're all getting a little tired of the time it takes to sort through it all. It takes time to research and find and steal and organize music. We're spending far too much time looking for music and not enough time savoring it. As a result, we're burning through bands and sounds faster than ever, and that's not good. 
I believe that we're returning to an era where people will seek out trusted filters and edited lists created by either algorithms or real people to help them discover music and music that's new to them. Conclusion eight, social media. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and whatever comes next will play a bigger and bigger part in music, its creation, its spread, and its consumption. If I knew how this was going to play out, I'd be investing now. But one thing is for sure, someone is going to get lucky with a good idea and get very, very rich. Item nine, the music business will continue to exist, although the old ways of doing things are gone forever. There are still years of trying to figure out how to make music pay and how musicians can get paid while still filling the needs, wishes, and demands of the consumer. And that's going to take a lot more than just lowering the price of songs in iTunes or the price of a CD. It's going to involve things like copyright reform, adjustments to tariffs, and a whole raft of international agreements. And finally, conclusion number 10. Rock music, despite how bad it may look at times, is never, ever going to go away. Humans have a hardwired need to make music. There's more music being made than ever before. More people are consuming music in more forms than ever before. More people are going to live shows than ever before. And rock has always proven to be unkillable, at least so far. So what does that mean to that 13-year cycle of rock versus pop that's been around since the 1950s? I started the show with this. I want to end with it. I think it's finally going to break down. It'll be torn apart by technology and the options and opportunities that technology allows for each of us. Sure, trends will come and go, but I can't see that happening with the ferocity that we've seen since the birth of rock. The music will just keep coming, just faster and more of it, and because we can all do our own thing, the notion of consensus breaks down, and when you have no consensus, cycles break down. We'll see what happens. I hope you got something out of these last 15 programs. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.